Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's great to see you all again. And um, we're going to talk today about some of the work we've been doing um, to understand storm surges, storm surge science, we call it. Uh, this effort started well, well before Sandy, actually. It started about 10 years ago, somewhere between Katrina in 2005, which devastated uh, New Orleans, and uh, Sandy that hit uh, New York, New Jersey in uh, October 2012. So that's over eight years ago. The memory is quickly fading. So I'm just going to whiz through a little bit of background, and Hamish uh, is going to change the slides. Um, Sandy was the most damaging storm since 1820. It caused uh, between 70 and $100 billion of damage in the tri-state area. Killed 233 people in eight countries on, as it came up from the Western Caribbean. At its peak, it was uh, uh, designated as a category three uh, hurricane, but as it uh, approached New York, it dropped down and changed its characteristics into more what's called an extra tropical storm. It was the largest storm ever recorded by the National Weather Service in terms of its size. It was 1,100 miles across from east to west. It uh, hit the New York, hit northern New Jersey on the night of the 29th of October. It was interesting that it was a high hit at high tide at, at Battery, New York City, and also the moon was full that night. It was a spring tide, so those two factors combined to create this uh, large storm surge that hit the hit the Long Island, hit the city. Um, the surge itself was about nine and a half feet, but combined with that extra high tide, it was about fourteen feet. Next slide, Hamish. Um, affected 24 states, the whole eastern seaboard from Florida up to Maine. Um, and then the, it caused flooding and destruction. You see here some coastal houses that were destroyed. There were thousands of them destroyed. Flooding streets, tunnels, the subway lines, cut, cutting power uh, on the eastern seaboard to over 10 million people. This is a brand new subway station that was uh, just built. Uh, it's called... Um, uh, South Ferry, the number one line down by the Staten Island Ferry, just finished at a cost to the taxpayer of $640 million prior to the New York City subway system completely destroyed. Uh, all, this, all the tunnels, six tunnels under the, under the uh, East River, subway tunnels were flooded, public transport was shut down, the Long Island Railroad was shut down 12 hours before the storm hit, all the subways and then the path trains to New Jersey. It, uh, as the winds approached and ca caused a lot of erosion along the South Shore, this is an example of one of Hamish's plots of, um, this is not a photograph, but it's a beautiful plot showing, you, this is Northern New Jersey, that Sandy Hook, New Jersey is that peninsula that sticks out at the entrance to the harbor, completely submerged there at the pe peak of the storm. The orange, the orange is the land level and that was being created post Sandy with um, very high resolution topographic data, it's called LIDAR data, made after the storm. Uh, next slide, Hamish. This is the same thing, but this is now the far Rockaway, uh, Jamaica Bay you're looking at. Um, Kennedy Airport, the very top of the picture. You can see the Barrier Beach, the Rockaways, which is very densely populated, uh, inundated, flooded for most of its length at the height of the storm. Next slide. Um, my involvement uh, with what we're going to talk about today goes back to March 29, where, along with Douglas Hill, a former adjunct professor at Stony Brook, we organized a conference uh, in Brook was, what was called then Brooklyn Polytech. It's now called uh, the Tandon School of Engineering of NYU in Brooklyn. And we got together and we invited six major engineering firms in the New York area and in the Netherlands to do presentations based on uh, building storm surge barriers, European style barriers that, that we thought may be able to pr protect the metro region. And from those, next slide Hamish, from those uh, recommendations in that book, um, well this just gives you an idea of the scale of Sandy. Um, you can see how huge it was as it was coming up the east coast. As, as a result of this conference, we, the, the different locations you can see in the inset there uh, for what we call sea gates or um, barriers, gateways across the Sandy Hook Rockway Peninsula. 
uh, and then up at Throg's Neck at the top, and then all along the South Shore of Long Island, conceptually, what would happen? Can we protect this whole metro region that got badly flooded? Next slide. That's just a blow up. You can, the, the light yellow is the, uh, the five boroughs in New York City, badly affected. Next slide. Um, this shows the bottom left, uh, a picture Keith put, to, uh, put together. This shows the, uh, actually at the Chesapeake Bay Tunnel, the Chesapeake Bay, this shows the, in blue, the, at the bottom, the sinusoidal wave is the normal astronomical tide driven by the sun and the moon and the rotation of the earth. And then the, the black line you see there is the sandy peak. So it's enormous compared with the normal tides. Um, the on the right there is, is some photographs taken in the Bay of Fundy. That's north of, uh, between Maine and Nova Scotia, Canada. And you can see it's got the world's highest tides and we learned a lot from the Canadians. Next slide. Um, now behind all this of how the question of how New York City, how Long Island can protect itself for the next 100 years. That's our time horizon. We don't know what's beyond that. I don't think anybody knows. And behind this, the ravages of storm surge, which are very sudden, short lived, acute events. It's a bit like in human terms, a heart attack. We have rising sea level. And the right, as you all know, the, the rate of rising sea level is something the whole planet is looking closely at. And depending on what we do as the human race and, and getting off fossil fuels, what we do to try and stop the rise in temperature, sea level is going to rise. It's already rising on the East Coast by about a foot every century. That's not due to recent climate change. But that's due to what's called uh, isostatic equilibrium as the continent readjusts itself following the last ice age with the relief of that weight of the uh, ice mass. So the East Coast is going down. It's, it's going down about a foot every century. That doesn't make any difference. It means it's coming up as for somebody at the edges. So depending on the different scenarios, uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has made these predictions. So this is what the Army Corps, uh, which is responsible for the maintenance of navigable waterways and harbors around the US, is using in their study. Next slide. So th these are these are actual observations. Uh, so you can see what Sandy looked like. Uh, the blue line again at the top is the astronomical tide that you get on in good weather. The green line was what was observed at the battery and the bottom one is at King's Point. They look different because the phase of the tides are different uh, uh, between the sound and the harbor. Next slide. This is uh, what we call the, the circle of protection, now focusing on uh, New York City. Our talk is divided into two parts, New York City and Southern Shore of Long Island. Next slide. Uh, just very quickly, what, this, what what's, uh, some European countries have done to protect their cities. This is uh, a huge swinging gates at Rotterdam in the Netherlands, a country that's almost half, 50% uh, below sea level and have been ravaged in the past by storms. Uh, it's a country that survives on protection um, and continuous nourishment of their, of their coastlines, their, their sand dunes, much the same as South Shore Long Island. Next slide, that's the Netherlands. This one's the uh, city of Venice, a, a project that the, Venice, the old ancient city is in uh, three um, inside the lagoon and with three inlets, a bit like the South Shore, and they have these swinging gates, very controversial, 30 years in the production, just at the testing stage. Next slide. Now this is uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. This is very interesting. They built this ring road around this Venice of the north on the River Neva Delta. There you can see in the harbor. Um, this was finished uh, only a few years ago by uh, Vladimir Putin, his hometown. Next slide. And here's some pictures of once again, these giant swinging gates at the harbor of, uh, of St. Petersburg in the Baltic Sea. Next slide. This is uh, an aerial view from uh, London and the United Kingdom, the Thames River. This is what they call the Thames River Barrier, opened in 1984 to stop the surges. The, river, the city is 15 miles up the river from the ocean. So they don't have giant waves to contend with, but they had the surges come up from the bottom right and these gates have been used, uh, they're used about 10, 12 times a year now with increasing frequency as sea level slowly rises. Next slide. 
There's another view of the Thames River barrier. These are gates that rotate. They normally sit on the sea floor on the bottom of the uh, river. Next slide. <clears throat> now, uh, in 2016, Congress uh, authorized a major study of uh, barrier system for the metro region. It's called HATS, Harbor and Tributary Study. It's a it's $20 million dollar study, controversial. They picked up on the recommendations of that conference I was telling you about at Brooklyn Polytech. And they looked at different barrier designs at different locations and did cost benefit analyses. Next slide. A number of, um, and uh, in, in nine, uh, January 17, 2020, I think it was, it says there that the New York Times published this article. And this had a devastating effect on the study. This article was full of, uh, full of mistakes. The author had been a war correspondent for the New York Times in Beirut, came back to New York, was given this assignment to pick up on the core study. They got everything wrong. Uh, there were like 18 different uh, errors in this report, including the price tag at the top there. Um, the next day, President Trump shut this whole core study down. Somebody must have brought this to his attention somebody who didn't like this idea. And this is his tweet, a massive $20 billion. He's inflated it 10 times, what the core estimated. Seawall built around New York to protect it from, I can't read it because the, uh, hang on. I can't read it because you're there, but basically he said this, this barrier system is costly, foolish, environmentally unfriendly idea, and it will probably look terrible. So you, New Yorkers, you just have to get your mops and buckets ready. He, sh as commander in chief of the armed forces, he shut the study down with a flick of a pen. Next slide. And now Mayor de Blasio of New York City outraged, shot right back. But the damage was, that was done, the project was shut down. My team was actually with the Army Corps in, uh, in Federal Plaza in Manhattan, talking to the Colonel and his engineers. And it just been shut down. They said, sorry, guys, we can't talk to you about this. I mean, it's all very friendly, but um, that's how policy is being made well, what, in the Trump era. Next slide. And so now well, let's move on there. I've covered like uh, number one, and I'm going to hand it over now to Hamish. Oh, sorry, oh, Keith. He's going to talk about our ocean neuro numerical modeling and what we think we can do using modern tools to uh, help public policy as what the city and what Long Island might do to protect ourselves for the next hundred years. Keith? Hey Malcolm, thank you very much. That was great. So as he said, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the modeling work that we've been doing, some more technical details and how we're developing these modeling systems and then how it's applied for operational forecasting and then also how we're investigating the efficacy of the barriers along the Great South Bay of Long Island. Uh, next slide. So there's really two ways that you can investigate, obviously, the role of barriers. You can, uh, if you have the barrier in place, you can analyze the water levels. But obviously, in our case, we don't have uh, these hypothetical barriers uh, installed along the Great South Bay. So we have to use a computer model to represent how things might change. And in order to do that, the most uh, predominant, pr prominent approach to do that is using numerical modeling. And numerical modeling relies on, much like as is the case in atmospheric science, you have a, a sequence of governing equations that represent first principles, such as primitive continuity and momentum conservation. And with those equations and a numerical technique, which I'm going to explain in the next slide, you can predict for things such as the water surface elevation, and the depth average velocity. And with those variables, you can perform analyses on uh, how things change when you put barriers in the model and how things change when you take them out. Much like as in the case of atmospheric science, we are solving the so-called shallow water equations. And these make the, length, the assumption that the vertical length scales are much smaller than the horizontal ones. As such, uh, these processes are, are called so-called long waves. Okay, so storm surge, astronomical tides, these are very, very long length scale processes. They do not behave like uh, a bathtub would. So when you go to, in, this is very important to say because when people first say, oh, you're gonna put a barrier in a place, they immediately think the water is going to behave like a bathtub. And uh, that is obviously not 
the case in this uh, work. So next slide. So in order to solve these equations, now we have our partial differential equations, we need a tool such as uh, the advanced circulation model to solve the equations. And advanced, this is a, a model that's been around for about three decades. It solves the 2D depth integrated barotropic equations. It's written in a Fortran programming language and it's coupled with several different wave models. So you can add different physics and whatnot. And so even though it's 30 years old, it's still being developed as a community that advances it. And actually I, I, I still do that. And it's uh, highly efficient. So it has a very high parallel efficiency scaling up to 10,000, 20,000 cores and still producing linear speed up. So it's very popular as a civil engineering tool as a result. Next slide. So in order to, so now we have our PDE and we have our program we need a, a actual inputs for the modeling system. And to do that, uh, AdCIRC uses a triangular unstructured mesh. And uh, in case you're not familiar with this concept, triangular unstructured mesh has nothing to do with fish or nets. It is a, uh, it's a way to discretize the domain using the finite element numerical method. And the way it works is you have variable element sizes. So in the deep ocean, you can see on panels A and B, the colors are, the yellow colors indicate the size of the triangles. We are going from around 12 kilometers all the way down to around 10 meters right near the shoreline. So we have highly localized elemental resolution right near the shore. The other key point that I wanna make on this slide is in the panel C, we are not just modeling the underwater components of the coastal circulation, we're also modeling over land. So wetting and drying processes. So as the, the, the parts of the model that are normally dry can wet given a sufficient force. The other final point I wanna make is that you might ask why we're using such a large domain to model such a highly localized region. And, and that's a really good question. And the reason is the length scales of the tropical cyclones are enormous. As uh, Malcolm pointed out, Hurricane Sandy occurred over the, the, the range of three, three days and it had a length scale in the order of 10 kilometers or more even. And so you need to re represent that, those wind forcing physics to get them accurate water levels. The other real reason why we use such a large domain is that the open ocean boundary, which is indicated in panel A as the dotted black line, needs to be sufficiently uh, in deep water, in, in sufficiently deep water to actually propagate the tides correctly on shore. You can't just put a barrier, for example, for the open ocean crossing a shelf, which is very shallow water, it leads to a lot of numerical problems. So that forces us to put, to, to simulate with very large domain. However, it doesn't come at a very expensive cost because the elemental size is varied so sufficiently that uh, the cost is highly efficient because we're placing the elements only in the, in the locations where we need to. So Keith, Next. how many triangles would there be in A? Uh, this mesh, I believe, has around 200,000 nodes and around a million triangles, but that's uh, off the top of my head. I'm not sure. So next slide. So uh, to, to generate this mesh, obviously, I'm not here with MS Paint drawing triangles. We need to have uh, advanced technology to incorporate the geospatial data sets like shoreline data sets like topobathy LIDAR data into the mesh generation process to improve the model's fidelity and to improve its uh, numerical stability as well. Uh, the historical approach to developing these model systems relied on hand-drawn meshes. So what I mean is somebody has a GUI, uh, graphical user interface, and they draw lines and of what element sizes they want. This is an extremely error prone process that takes months and months and months. So in this uh, work called Ocean Mesh 2D, which was uh, part of my PhD thesis, I developed this tool to, to script the generation of the models that we use to do that. And actually, uh, when I came back to Stony Brook, uh, when I met Malcolm, we decided we were gonna use this tool to investigate how uh, to use, to explore the question of barriers along the South Shore of Long Out. So unfortunately, this talk is not about Ocean Mesh. I'd love it to be, but it's not. Uh, so you, you can go to the link. It's free software. It's open source. And you can read the paper that was published recently. Okay, next slide. 
So the way that the mesh generation process works, and this is not the mesh that we use for this work, but it's just an example on the website, is that you can, uh, in, a, in about 30 lines of code in MATLAB programming language, you can uh, use Ocean Mesh to script the development of the modeling system and all the related input files. So I can press run on this file, and then it will produce all the input files and we can use it to run our simulations. And this is what we've been using to do all our work for this project. And it's turned out to work fairly well, especially because we can incorporate, for example, the post-Sandy LiDAR data sets directly into the model generation process. This really improves the numerical modeling stability because it's not, uh, it considers, for example, the, current, uh, the CFL limit uh, a priori. So you do not need to uh, run it and see if it works or not. It's generally much more stable than those historical manual approaches. So uh, this is the tool that we're using to investigate. These are all the tools really to investigate the modeling work that we're doing for, for this project. So next slide. So the first thing you do when you get a model like this, like I showed you with the triangular elements is you need to validate certain aspects of the model you need to validate that the model is predicting the physical phenomenon correctly. So just as a reminder on the top right, I put an image of the time series of water levels. In order to get accurate tide, uh, total water level predictions, you need to predict the tide and the wind driven force and pressure force component of water levels, both. Okay, so if the tides are off, then your total water level prediction will be off too. And so in these, in these pictures, what I'm showing you is for our modeling system, which is called GSBV4, an acronym for Great South Bay. Uh, what I'm showing is a scatter plot, a one-to-one -one plot of modeled amplitude and observed amplitude data for the two major tidal constituents for this area. So this is not including winds or meteorological forcing. And what you can see is, uh, albeit some outliers, the performance is really good. Uh, what you can see also is that if you look on the y-axis on the right on the left plot, the modeled amplitude, uh, the, the amplitude of the M2 is, is around one meter or, or 80, 80 centimeters to one meter, while the K1 amplitude is around five to 10 centimeters. So it's really important that we get that right in order to get the total water level correct. And our modeling system is doing a great job at predicting both those major constituents. Okay, next slide. So after you validate the tides, the next step typically in your progression of making sure that the modeling system is working is you look at total water level. So here, what we're doing is predicting Hurricane Sandy uh, using both tides, winds, and pressure, no waves yet. And what we see is fairly good agreement. These are various options. So the black lines on these subplots are observational data sets. So observational time series of various gauges throughout the New York area and uh, Long Island Sound. And what you can see is the phasing is almost perfect, which is excellent. The amplitude is somewhat underpredicted at some stations, and that can be due to a number of reasons. Um, it could be related to the physical representation in the model. It could also be uncertainty or error in the wind forcing. Here we're using uh, a very fancy wind product called Ocean Weather Incorporated to force the model. Besides that, um, the other point I wanna make is that the stations have uncertainty too with the vertical datums. Typically what happens after some time is the, the vertical uh, datum of the station drifts due to various things. So that's interesting to follow. But uh, overall good agreement and excellent predictions, especially at the Battery and Kings Point. Okay, next slide. So I apologize for the quality of the slide. I just uh, didn't have a high quality image of here, but we're also able to validate qualitatively the overland flooding extent. So on the left-hand side is what was determined through observation, what areas flooded. And on the right-hand side is the areas that were flooded in the model. So the lighter colors indicate higher water elevations and the dark colors vice versa. And so what you can see is fairly good agreement if you go back and forth between the two slides, especially in um, the Western Long Island Sound region and also in the Great South Bay. So this model system is predicting this overland flooding as well as the underwater uh, coastal circulation processes as, as well. Okay, next slide. So uh, just to kind of summarize here, we're, we're using this modeling system 
actually, we've been using this modeling system, not just me, but uh, Hamish and Malcolm for about 14 years. And uh, this is the front page of the Stony Brook Storm Surge Prediction System. Hamish was so kind to actually start running this new model that I just showed you, GSBV4, on the system. You can find the predictions on there. And if you click one of the, this is a not, this is a screenshot, so I can't click it. But if you go to the website, which I'm going to show in the next slide, then you can investigate all these tabs and click the zooms and it's operational forecast. So next slide. So as I said, it was developed around 14 years ago. It was after post Katrina. It was a post Katrina development. Um, and it, it produces for water levels for research purposes only. So it's not meant to be used for navigation or very important decisions, okay? Um, it's run 25 times a day. This is actually much more when I was at SOMAS uh, a long time ago. Um, and, it's, and it's forced by eight different meteorological models. So it has an ensemble forecast at a 3.5 day prediction horizon. So these, this is uh, real time stuff that's happening and it's validated with real time data. You can go on there and look at yourself. Next slide. So for example, this, in, this is a, an example of a forecast that you can investigate by going to the website, you can see that in the next couple hours, the next day, we're going to have a back surge event at the Battery in New York around half a meter. These are fairly interesting events where the water actually blows out to sea, and so that you get a negative water level anomaly near the shoreline. So you can see that there's fairly, actually, fairly good consensus amongst the ensemble members in this forecast, and we're also we're forced with different wharf uh, member ensembles, and we're also compared uh, on, on different tabs. You can see comparisons with the Stevens New York Institute model, NY Hops, I think it's called, and also the NOAA Global SDOPS model, which was recently put into operations. So this can give you um, a good sense of what's happening with the uh, water levels near shore. But like I said, it's not meant to navigate a ship. So that, that needs more work. Anyway, next slide. <clears throat> so the other last point I want to make about this is that you can subscribe for an RSS feed. And uh, there's other ways to receive warnings and alerts if the water level is going to be high or low or whatnot. And so it, go to the site for more information about that. But it's pretty cool. If there's a storm coming by, you typically get an alert and you can see what your hometown is, how the water level is going to be. Uh, near close to your house. Okay, next slide. So just getting back to the barriers and how we're modeling them in this uh, unstructured finite element mesh type of approach is we're actually representing them as static weirs. And a weir is a, is a common terminology in civil engineering. It's a, a barrier for better, for lack of better words, that obstructs the flow of water. And it can actually have these things called cross pipes where the flow can actually go underneath the barrier. Inside the ADSERC model, there, there's parameterizations for how flow overtops these barriers and such. So in terms of our modeling work, we represent these barriers as this kind of dagger-like structure inside the mesh connectivity. And on each side, there's a front face and a back face, and then the water is uh, overtopped. So there's a momentum transfer event that happens when a certain parameterization is uh, is met. And in that case, um, this, this object can never be fully submerged. So there's always going to be some overtopping events. So it makes some assumptions about the physical processes. But for all intents and purposes, this is a static structure that's placed into the model. And we, we uh, want to stress that it's not time bearing. It can be time bearing. But to a first order, we typically just put the barrier in and investigate what the impact or what the role is on the total circulation if it was closed for the entire duration of an event. Okay, next slide. So for example, um, this is a picture of the, the barrier system that was proposed in one of Malcolm's uh, works that he talked about for regional storm surge barrier protection. And it extends from around Sandy Hook on the bottom right here, which is the red is the coastline, oh, yeah. <clears throat> to, to Breezy Point. And this is a regional barrier protection system. So the idea was that it would provide protection for the whole region 
right? It wouldn't just be for a small local area. But one of the challenges is very large. Obviously, it's a huge, tremendous structure. So it's it's a be a very challenging structure to construct. Nevertheless, what we were investigating is what's the role of this barrier on, on the coastal ocean circulation. If you close it, for example, during a hurricane like Sandy, you know, a lot of people had speculated that the water would just bunch up against the barrier and then just flood all of Rockaway and all of the other areas. Uh, what we've shown, and actually Hamish will show, is that's not, not the case at all. And there's very little setup that actually occurs on the front face of the barrier. So this is just an example of some of the work that we're doing. In the next slide, I'll show. So this is for the Great South Bay. So this is the Great South Bay mesh that we created for this project. And this is Robin Moses Beach. And you have the, the connection, the bridge between the uh, mainland and, and the barrier beaches that cuts across the inlet, where you see the red line on the bottom right panel. It's, it's literally right in front of it. So this was one of the barrier designs that we investigated is uh, putting a barrier right there. And the key point that I wanna make here is that using the Ocean Mesh 2D, we can actually insert the barrier locally into the mesh while keeping the rest of the mesh connectivity identical. So if we go to do a model intercomparison, it, is, uh, it won't show changes, for example, in long out sound or something. So we only see local changes where we put local things which is really important when trying to analyze or quantify how much these, these features affect the coastal ocean circulation inside the bay and the related neighboring areas. So now I'm gonna hand it off to Hamish and he's gonna talk about some of the results that we've obtained using these modeling systems. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. So we have uh, lots of options. You know, we, it's just sort of this toolbox or sandbox. We can play around with putting gates in various places. And as Keith mentioned, we can open and close them at various times. So basically what we do with one of these weirs is we lower it to the sea floor. And so it effectively acts as an open gate in that case. Uh, so here's just an example of what we're looking at, at Hurricane Sandy, but putting gates at Frog's Neck and also at uh, Sandy Hook. Hey, Mitchell, the excuse me. So the entrance <clears throat> to Bureau hey, Park, yes? The chat's just come in. The, can you speak up a little? OK, I'll try. So uh, in, in this plot, the colored line is the water height. And the gray line in the background is the speed of the water, the velocity coming out of New York Harbor. So the idea here would be you close the gate at the uh, low tide before the storm, and then uh, keep it closed until low tide after the storm had passed. So here's just a look at uh, a run of New York Harbor uh, without any gates in place, and then one with gates in place, and look at the difference of that. So this is a difference plot. And this is, well, this is a preliminary plot, uh, and we have a lot more work to do on it. It's showing that there's only a few more inches of uh, water flooding on those outer beaches while pr protecting the rest of New York City. And actually, it can be a bit lower in other places as well. Here's an animation of that happening. So you see that red line frog snack bridge is already closed and the water in Long Island Sound is, is higher but not spilling into New York City. Now it's closed down at the entrance near Carver. You can see the flood water, uh, or the surge of water in the outer ocean is protected. Uh, the city's protected from that. So it, and as we zoom in, uh, there's a lot more detail. These arrows are just showing the flow rate. So here's a picture of a similar thing up at Throg's Neck Barrier. And that uh, you'd only get a couple extra inches of flooding on the uh, unprotected side of the barrier. Uh, I'll just mention with this one as well, we're trying to find the worst case scenario. So in an earlier slide, we showed that Western Long Island Sound 
Sandy's landfall is actually at low tide there as opposed to the high tide it was in lower Manhattan. And so in this uh, example, we've actually shifted the winds so that landfall hits right at high tide at King's Point. And this is to sort of show the uh, worst case scenario. So at worst case, it would be an extra three inches. We've also coupled into the model uh, SWAN, which is a wave model. And it runs in parallel with the uh, surge model, hydrodynamic surge model. So we get uh, extra setup due to uh, breaking of waves, pushing in. And so these plots are showing the wave heights. Now we're seeing uh, maximum wave heights of 17.4 meters in the open ocean. That's about 57 feet, and that's pretty big waves. As it comes into New York City, uh, the shelf gets a bit shallower, and so the waves break offshore. And so at the barrier itself, you might only be looking at uh, three or four meters deep of wave height that the shirt have to deal with. So we validated this uh, during Sandy, there was sort of one major operational wave buoy operating at the time. And that's this famous 44025. And it's shown on the map at the bottom with a white circle around it. And so on the graph, you can see the uh, observation from the wave buoy. And then the dashed blue line is what our model result. So it's, uh, it's quite a good match, I would say. So further onto this, I did an analysis and looked at uh, the major storms of the last 30 years, which are the ones we have good uh, weather data for and good wind data for. And the five that came up as the uh, most important flooding events were these uh, five storms. Uh, I remember the movie, The Perfect Storm, in the book. Uh, so that was based on this 1991 storm. There was a major one in 1992, which was a nor'easter that stuck around for a few days. There was a very fast storm which came up the East Coast called the Storm of the Century in 93, and then hurricanes on Green and Sandy in 2011, 2012, respectively. So here's just a look at uh, this red line across the bottom of Long Island. Uh, and then on the right-hand side is uh, water levels for those five storms uh, from all the way from Breezy Point, the Anchorage Harbor on the left to Montauk Point on the right-hand side. And you'll see that the further east you go for these five storms, sort of less the floodwaters were. Sandy is of course the major uh, storm in this period. And then the 92 one is the second highest. So I'll just, these are the results from the five different storms. Uh, you can see the 91 nor'easter, that is major, mainly a Long Island Sound event. Uh, the Atlantic Ocean going into New York Harbor is not showing uh, much response. If I go to the 92 nor'easter, which again is our second larger one, second largest one, uh, you can see Long Island Sound is quite a bit of flooding. This is actually Northport, uh, Central, getting to Central Long Island Sound. This was the major event, more than Sandy. You can also see in New Jersey, the Arkin River, Perth Anvoy, is starting to get a bit of focusing of water up there. Here's a 93 storm. Uh, and it, it's uh, much like uh, Sandy. Sorry, not much like Sandy, much like the 91 storm. Continue on. So here's Irene, which is very similar again. It's actually, I should say, even more similar to the 91 storm, but it's different in that it does not, uh, well, it does flood New York Harbor. You can also, I don't know if you can make it out in your screens, but there's just a bit more wave set up along the barrier beaches on the south shore of Long Island. And so here's Sandy, which is uh, deeper reds. I'll mention all these plots all have the same color scale. And so you get the maximum flooding here is up in New Jersey. 
even though it seems like it's out like us, not by us. Now you can also see in Great South Bay, the wind blown the water uh, towards the west. So I'll move on to talking a bit more about Great South Bay now, which is some of our recent work, and it's uh, very preliminary, but we're working on it. And so there's a number of issues involved. Uh, you know, it's nor'easters stick around for a few days. And instead of just uh, sort of the wind blowing the water back and forth in the bay, you have Ekman forcing, raising and lowering the entire ocean sort of offshore, which over the course of days will fill up the bay. Something like a hurricane travels through very quickly and so you're much more uh, prone to risk depending on the state of the high tide, whereas a nor'easter, if you stick around for a few days, you may get flooding over multiple high tides. So we have a couple of research questions we're looking at, trying to look at how much is uh, driven by the ocean and how much is local wind, and also the height of the dunes and how much they will be protected. So here's the result. We've uh, put barriers, the entrances to all the South Shore inlets. Uh, with the exception of Riches, which uh, we have some artificially low dunes or so flooding that. But yeah, the rest, I think, are fairly realistic. I'll just uh, zoom in on this next picture. So this is showing the maximum water level for the entire model run for Hurricane Sandy. Now you can see we've got JFK Airport and Jamaica Bay in the top left, are well protected. We have a bit of flooding happening at East Rockway Inlet and uh, Long Beach. I don't know if you can make it out, but just around the northern end of that little red line, which is a barrier, we're getting a bit of seawater coming in. So the point here is you can't just build these structures and the inlets and then close them for a few hours any time a hurricane hits uh, if the dunes are low because it will just flood right over the top of the dunes. And de depending on how well those dunes are nourished, you, you will get your complete protection or not. This is a summary plot of uh, in Hurricane Sandy. And this is looking at how much inland flooding there was uh, in a run with the barriers in place and without the barriers in place. So the little red dots are where the on land bits of the model flooded without barriers and the blue in the region where it is still where it's flooding with the barriers in place. And so even with barriers you will often get a bit of flooding but the hope is that not nearly as much as you would without them. So the point of this slide is, uh, you know, we've got 80 years until 2100, which is what all these IPCC uh, forecasts of, you know, meter higher sea level. You know, since I started at SOMAS, the uh, ocean water around the planet's gone up by about 12, 15 centimeters, which is enormous when you think about the size of the world. Uh, but in the past, we've made huge progress as a people within 80 years. This is the Oklahoma land rush on the top left, going to the Wright brothers' plane to walking on the moon, all within the time between now and the end of this century, when the sea level rise really start to kick in. So we, we, it's not all doom and gloom. We have opportunities. And I'll invite Malcolm and Keith to come back with uh, the conclusions about what this actually means. Sure, Keith. Do you, do you want to <clears throat> excuse me? Do you want to add to that? No, I think that the the basic point here is that you can't just protect. You just can't close off the barriers, uh, the inlets. You have to also consider the height of the dunes. You have to do a lot of dune reinforcement. Uh, with this modeling work, we're able to identify those regions that are likely going to be flooded, uh, and and uh, will need to be reinforced. Uh, the other major point is that uh, there's a lot of wind-driven setup on the western side of the Great South Bay due to its uh, long axis is, is basically aligned with the direction of the wind during a strong surge event. 
the station or the wind setup inside the, the bay is going to be very large, regardless if you have barriers in place. And so we're trying to quantify, quantitatively quantify, uh, how much water is due to coming in from inside the inlets and how much water is actually due to the wind driven setup processes. And I think with that information, we'll be able to uh, better inform the communities uh, what is actually a good plan and what's not a good plan, what's not going to really be effective. But this is a, this is a really research based activity. This is not a, I don't, I don't work for the Army Corps of Engineers, for example, but hopefully this information will trickle out and, uh, you know, get out to other people. So um, in summary, you know, we've just touched on the conceptual side of this. I mean, barriers are controversial. There are concerns about, <clears throat> is it going to affect the circulation? Is it going to affect the flushing characteristics? Is it going to be impediment to the migration of marine mammals and fish? Um, so <clears throat> maintenance of water quality. So these are all important questions, which we are looking at as well, but was not the focus of our talk. Um, and no matter what you do, it's, it's, it's extra, ex, extraordinarily expensive. Like just the nourishment of the South Shore beaches is an ongoing process. The, the Army Corps of Engineers has been doing that for, for, for many decades. It's controversial. I mean, you have communities on the South Shore don't want their views blocked by dunes that are built up too high. But as we've seen from the modeling, and especially during Sandy, and there's some other storms that uh, overtopping the dunes is a, is a relatively common experience. The Dutch, and they, they just, they have made a huge investment in nourishing the, their coastline. And we haven't really faced up to that ourselves. And so we're just as vulnerable since Sandy. There have been, uh, particularly in New York City, there has been a lot of uh, back and forth. You've got three states, you've got one of the world's largest cities. You've got the politics involved between the, the president and the governors and the mayor of the city. Uh, there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of human misery that it still exists eight years later. A lot of people's homes were wrecked, uh, lives destroyed. They didn't have the money to rebuild. It just goes on and on below the right, the news radar. Um, so we're very aware of all this. Uh, will, the, will the Biden administration bring back the Army Corps HAT study? We think it should, um, but we also believe that uh, there needs to be changes in the parameters on which they're constrained to operate in terms of calculating what we call cost benefit analyses. How much do these things cost and what's the benefit? If the benefit doesn't exceed the cost, then the army will not uh, promote the, these concepts. Um, there are barriers already existing on the local scale in Stanford, Connecticut, Providence, Rhode Island, and New Bedford, Massachusetts, as well as uh, around the city of New Orleans down south. So I think we'll stop there. <clears throat> stop there and we've got a few minutes for questions. Hi, Malcolm. This is Steve Hagiani from Cameron Engineering. How are you? Oh, good. We've got to mention that we're, we're doing the South Shore study in conjunction with the uh, uh, well-known Long Island engineering firm, Cameron Engineering. Yeah, thank you. Great presentation, Hamish and Keith <laughs> and Malcolm. You know, I had a question. Is there much connectivity between the Long Island Sound and the South Shore, the Great South Bay, other than through Throg's Neck? Could you maybe explain that? Is there a lot or not? Not much at all. No, there's no connection um, at all. Um, I mean, Long Island is an island. The East River is the main, the main connection of the sound to the harbor. Uh, most people don't realize that during Sandy, there were two surges in the harbor. The first one came up through the, through the, um, the main entrance to the harbor under the Verrazano Bridge. But the second surge came roaring through Long Island Sound and the East River, and they kind of collided in the lower East River and that's where most of the flooding occurred, actually. But that's, there's no direct connection. So uh, I, this is Josie. That was really interesting. And thanks for the review, um, Malcolm. So not, I was impressed with the fact that although Venice has put up these barriers in the Adriatic to protect the city, that hasn't always worked very well. Right. It's um, if the, the <laughs> I was over in Venice a couple of years ago and, and had a, a tour of the whole facility, but 
uh, it's a long convoluted study uh, uh, experience, Josie, uh, that's been fraught with politics and corruption. But the Minister of Culture and the Italian government said that uh, to protect this World Heritage City, um, Venice, that the three inlets, the three barriers would have to be completely underwater during normal weather. So there would be no compromise to the to the vista that millions of tourists see so that that right there created a huge problem of building things completely underwater i mean as we all know the the um salt water is very corrosive and it's very maintenance is very difficult the, their barriers were like sort of fingers like almost like piano keys that sort of they're hollow concrete things and they sit on the floor of the inlets think of fire island inlet jones inlet and they, come, they pump air and they come up like this and they're all sort of like this. I think it's a very poor design. I think it's, uh, it wasn't really designed to stop storms rather than, rather than just uh, extra high tides. Uh, it was tested a few, uh, few months ago. Um, I think the jury's out as to how good this is going to be. So that's not the design that we would recommend for the South Shore. Our recommendation is the, is the Thames River type barriers which uh, have a number of important features, which I don't have time to go into, and could be could be readapted for the inlets. Hey, Malcolm. Yeah. We have a question in the chat. I'll just uh, yeah I'll read it out loud. The question is, what do you think about bringing land use factors into quantifying the amount of inland flooding, asking for an urban planner disaster mitigation research? Well, if you look at the city of Stamford, Connecticut, the, the Army Corps <clears throat> built that barrier in the 1960s, and it's been used for every major storm since, uh, including Sandy. There was no flooding of Stamford, Connecticut, and that that uh, protection afforded that community meant that city development, economic development, could take place with more <clears throat> with more safety, more uh, confidence inside the barrier, and that's what's happened. So. There are many opportunities. Unfortunately, the Army Corps regulations constrain them not to look at um, possible future opportunities, but really how much it would cost or how much would it save uh, from otherwise damaged what's called discounted property. In other words, if a warehouse on a dock is washed away, how much would it cost to replace that dock the way it was? And that's a far cry from, from really the opportunity and security that a regional system would give the cities in the next hundred years. So, so Malcolm, just to kind of ask another question to that, you're saying that the Army Corps is not capable of investigating future benefits of those barriers. That's correct. And that's not because they don't want to, but uh, they're, they're constrained by regulation. So I think if this, uh, the Biden administration um, restart, <clears throat> restarts the HAT study, Harbor and Tributary Study, uh, we recommend that there need to be a number of changes in the working parameters to come up with a more uh, realistic estimate of not only the cost, but the benefits. Mm -hmm. So I'll just add to this uh, on the modeling end of things. For our inland flooding, we are incorporating uh, USGS's National Land Use Database to uh, add the bottom friction into the model. So it slows down the water flow inland over areas of uh, sort of high friction. So it travels a lot more slowly than sort of that's a, big, that's a big challenge, actually, uh, modeling flow over land. I mean, we don't get down to the street level. As Keith said, the minimum size of a triangle is about 10 meters, 33 feet. You might say, well, that's the width of a road, which is true. But um, the devil's in the details. And local communities, mayors, and first responders are always saying, well, tell me about my hamlet. Tell me about my village. Uh, is this street going to flood? Is that street going to flood? What do I do? And we, we, we have to tell them that every storm is different. The wind can suddenly change direction and speed uh, that cannot be predicted by the model. Um, it's a dangerous game to try and get down to house by house or street by street level protection. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we have to be honest about it. 
and as I said, uh, nature's full of surprises. Malcolm, we have, I think, one time for one more question. The question yep. is, do you think that the Big U project in Manhattan is useful given that we probably need a larger scale solution to protect the larger area? Well, the Big U, well, what the Big U is, I didn't mention this, but following Sandy, um, uh, there was a huge international competition called Rebuild by Design that was organized by the Housing and Urban Development Corporation, the federal government. And there were 148 entries from all over the world with some very fancy and uh, beautiful looking problems about how to protect various pieces of New York City. The, of those 148, the, the top winner was uh, a, a project to build a kind of a horseshoe, a wall around Southern Manhattan, you know, the, the famous Battery Park area. And they got funding, they got $100 million to continue the study. Trouble is with the, the big U is that, well, there's a lot of practical reasons that you can't just build a brick wall and expect it to stay up. You've got to dig foundations 25 feet down if you're going to build a 25 foot wall. You're going to block everybody's view. Uh, you put a shovel on the ground in, in Manhattan and you hit something, you hit water pipes, power cables, sewer systems, subway tunnels. It's a nightmare. And so <clears throat> the other problem was in this study, these 148 entries, it really wasn't, it was a lot of work by architects, urban planners, but there was no engineering to bring a sense of um, reality to the competition. So that whole southern Manhattan area has languished. Nothing has been built since Sandy, and there are all kinds of uh, bits and projects. So the actual big U has become known by some people as the broken J, but there is money and Battery Park is thinking of protecting. But once again, it's all very piecemeal. If you add up the total perimeter of the harbor and the lower Hudson River, it's close to a thousand miles. <clears throat> the Dutch will say, you've got to shorten the coastline. And that's what the Seagates are intended to do. So uh, I think we have time for just one more quick question. I can answer this one. Jan Gia asks, can you talk more about the details about the wind forcing? How did you simulate the historical hurricanes? So Jan, we, uh, we had publicly available data from one of the, I believe, FEMA's studies for these five nor'easters. And for, the, for some of them, uh, I can send you the link if you're interested in, but it's uh, the wind forcing inside of Adstrick. I can talk more about technical details offline with you, but basically the model ingests 15 minute winds and it uses that to force a wind stress on the surface <laughs> of the ocean. What about team members, Bill Golden and, and an adjunct professor at Stony Brook is actually driving his car. Bill, you <laughs> you better keep your eyes on the road. <laughs> He's got his microphone turned off. Oh, thank, you. Thank, thank you, Josie. So we have more time, so you don't oh, have okay. to okay. Oh, okay. quit if there are more questions. Sure. So. Any other questions out there? If not, I guess you can send them to Malcolm, but uh, thanks, that was really good. Now everyone send letters to Biden. Yes, yeah, Steve Schwartz has a question. Sorry? Yeah, hi, I, uh, <clears throat> I really enjoyed the talk. I thought it was very nicely done. Um, and I, uh, especially the comparisons with the observations. I thought that was great. You, uh, you showed the, f the five storm study. Is, um, it would be nice to have, um, uh, uh, to be able to peruse that in more detail. Are, are there links available or, or maybe they could be uh, distributed? So you're talking about the results, the model model results? Yeah, I, 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 I don't want to get into the, the, the nuts and bolts, but I'd be very interested to see the, the model results. The other thing I'm thinking about, you're, you're talking about overtopping the, the, the barrier, barrier beaches. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, there'll be a certain amount of overtopping, but, but surely the, 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 the volume of water must be much less than what would be there in the absence of the barriers. That's a good point. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I was just trying to stress that it's uh, some, for example, if we look at Robert Moses and uh, the fire, or sorry, the it's been some time since I've been in Long Island, but basically the, the barrier in front of the Robert Moses Causeway 
that we had proposed that has a very thin section of the land there. And so it can actually create more overtopping in some areas uh, locally right next to the barrier. And that could actually cause maybe some, uh, some new inlets to form. Like for example, the new inlet that formed, the new old inlet that had formed on the uh, South shore potentially could happen again in different areas of the barrier beaches. So that's, uh, we have to be careful that, you know, we don't create situations like that if we design these barrier systems uh, because it, it would have effect obviously on the ambient co uh, coastal circulation. Although we would hope that it wouldn't have a large effect, it's going to inevitably affect the circulation in some capacity. So it's I this is Bill Golden speaking from his moving automobile. What's that, Bill? We can't hear you. <laughs> I'm sorry. The can't hear. I'm laughing. I'm laughing. Uh, this is the first time we've had a mobile participant. I'm sorry that the quality of the sound. Um, you'll have to when you stop and you're safely off the highway, you send a chat. But Hamish, can you just pop up that those wiggly lines that you had up a moment ago? Sure, just hang on. Um, I'll just explain what those are. Um, but while he's doing that, uh, while Sandy was in progress, it was almost like a kind of an international competition between weather forecasting services around the world and everybody wanted to see what was going to happen to Sandy. And so there's, uh, we, we didn't show you the graph, but there are multiple tra trajectories of that storm. And most of them actually never made landfall. They came up the East Coast and they veered off to the East. This actually is uh, at Stony, these are our Stony Brook attempts to predict, well, I guess it's a hindcast after the event, but to predict where this storm might make landfall. And each of the, Hamish, you can explain, but each of these lines is a, is a slightly different, um, using a slightly different wind field, I think. And, but yeah, you so see, this, go ahead. Uh, this is a series of hurricane wharf uh, weather models run at Penn State University. And uh, one of Ping's colleagues uh, got this data for us. And so this is Hurricane Sandy, and there was about 70 different members uh, 70 different model runs, weather models, all running slightly different starting conditions. Uh, and the storm, Sandy ends up hitting the East Coast at like wildly different times. Sometimes it never even makes the coast. These are just the ones that hit the coast. And so the time of landfall and where it makes landfall uh, ends up sort of being a weighted average of all these different model runs. So we, uh, well, in hindsight, we can sort of pick the model run that did the best and work with that for wind data. But, but it just shows you a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty, and as both the physical location where landfall was made, you look some even hit one of them even hit Cape Cod, and the timing, and so it's, it's a notoriously difficult project. And this is not for lack of trying or lack of. It's just the um, that tiny changes in initial conditions or the physics can alter the, the, the those wiggly lines are the are the are the trajectory the pathway of the eye of the storm, and they're all wrong. I mean, none of them got it exactly right. I don't think. Hey, Mister Dick. No, but. Uh... This is uh, Steve here. Um, my recollection is the, that almost all the weather models had it going out to sea, and only the European Center got it go, even going uh, to make landfall in the New York area. Well, that's right. Oh, I, I think that narrative has maybe played up a bit more than <laughs> actually happened. They, they, they might have been 3% better. You know, <laughs> it was, uh, there's a lot of angst involved in that. But Well, I know the... Um... There are, there's, as, as I showing the picture here, you know, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of models and they're all trying to pick which one's the most realistic using sort of a bit of intuition and experience. But as time goes on, 
uh, the models improve, the supercomputers get more powerful. Are you, are you there still, Brian? You maybe you have a comment. He must have left. Um, I, know, I know the Department of Defense, the US Department of Defense actually uses the British weather model for some of their, their work. So there's a lot of international cooperation um, between different countries that have active uh, modeling or uh, well, weather forecasting of their own. Um, but what actually happens with the flooding, the local flooding depends very much on the on the small scale structure of the storm once it once it uh, when, once if you look at New York Harbor, you know once that once that storm surge has come into the harbor, how it distributes locally between New Jersey uh, and uh, Manhattan and so forth depends very much on the on the local winds and its uh, short time scale fluctuations. What's that, Hamish? Comment. Um, we're on the South Shore, uh, Santa Maria area, um, uh, uh, Fort River, and during the period of time uh, subsequent to the '91 storm, which made the new breach uh, at at uh, West Hampton, uh, we tended to get much more uh, high high tides, and for that matter, low low tides, uh, than. Uh, it was before that breach or su subsequent to the breach having been filled back in. So uh, changes, just changes in the connectivity make a big difference in, in the, um, uh, the, the tidal scope uh, here uh, on the center Mauritius side of, of uh, Mauritius Bay. Well, that's, that's true enough, but uh, I don't know if Charlie Flagg's still on the line, Charlie, but he's done a uh, a huge amount of work on the this what's called the New Old Inlet at the far eastern end of Great South Bay, and flown monthly overflights, uh, photographic flights, and um, I call it the Flag Inlet because Charlie knows more about that new inlet than anybody else on the planet. Are you there, Charlie? No, I think he he left. Okay, so the, a big concern, uh, Steve, of residents. Uh, I know, I know you're talking about what was called the Pike uh, Pike Inlet, I think. Um, and the Army Corps did yeah. fill that in. I know Correct. that. I know that the Blue Point, as a Blue Point Oyster Company, wanted to kept open because the water quality had improved remarkably. They had the best uh, clam set in 20 years. In fact, they went to federal court to, and sued the Army Corps of Engineers. And I was asked to, and many older, and I was asked to participate as a scientific expert. But the but the Army Corps bulldozed. <laughs> literally and figuratively um, over the objections of the Blue Point Oyster Company. And it was filled in again. The, 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 the New Old Inlet, the eastern, eastern Great South Bay, is actually in the Fire Island National Seashore. So it's protected by the, the fact that it's a national park. It's also um, what's called the Otis Pike Memorial. There's a piece of uh, berm of sand dune there that, that uh, recognizes former um, uh, Long Island, I think it was a state senator, Otis Pike. And so there's a double layer of protection. So there's a kind of an agreement between the, the Army and the National Park Service to uh, watch, uh, to sort of um, careful watch and wait, waiting and watching the inlet to see how it changes. And we, do, we were speaking to Charlie two or three days ago, and he says that, that, that inlet, of, uh, it was punched through by Sandy, is slowly closing up, but uh, it's had a remarkable effect on the the water quality within Great South Bay with the increased flushing. And I don't know whether um, there's been experience uh, like yours, Steve, about increased tidal range, but you might ex uh, in Great South Bay. I think it's quite small, but the salinity certainly went up somewhat. But uh, you would expect that if you are making a new inlet, then more water is coming in and out each day through that new channel. Yeah, yeah, just for the record, Otis Pike was U.S. Congressman. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. So I don't know what's going to happen there. The it seems to be that it's it's um, it's going to be left alone, at least for the foreseeable future, um, because there's been no catastrophe since. We'll see. So well, again, we did, I mean, we thank you. I thought this was a great talk. 
Well, thank you, Steve, um, and for your interest in the SOMAS lecture series. For those who don't know, St Stephen is a, uh, a cloud physics sci scientist at Brookhaven National Lab. He's also an adjunct professor at SOMAS, and so it's always good to have you, Steve. Yeah, thank you for that. And I'm planning to teach a seminar course in the fall on uh, biogeochemical cycles. Oh, good. Okay. Good. All right. Well, thank you very much, um, Malcolm, Hamish, and Keith. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all soon. Yeah, thanks, Josie. Thanks, everybody. Thank you as well. It was great. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.